right, so with great pleasure, I am here to inform you that six weeks into the school year, we finally get to begin with chemistry. Chemistry starts today. And since chemistry is the study of matter, the best way to start with chemistry is to talk about what is matter made up of? What, what, is, what is matter? What, what, what's, what's matter? Stuff. stuff and bits. So today we're going to talk about stuff and bits. Stuff and bits. Now, you aren't shocked, you aren't awed, you might not even be paying attention anymore, but when atomic theory was first proposed, it sounded pretty crazy. And yes, we call it atomic theory, using the scientific definition of theory, which is a well-tested set of ideas that explains many disparate observations, not the colloquial definition of theory, which is a guess. Though luckily there's no one running around anymore saying, atoms are just a theory. But it wasn't that long ago that people were running around saying that, and you want to know who settled it for good? Einstein. Atoms had been postulated for a long time by the 20th century, but it wasn't until Einstein mathematically proved the existence of atoms and molecules in 1905 that the matter was truly settled. And you thought Einstein was all about relativity and E equals mc squared. He also proved atoms exist. Here's how it happened. In 1827, a botanist named Robert Brown was looking at pollen grains in water through a microscope, and he noticed that they jiggled randomly even when there was no movement to cause the jiggling. It was a mystery for a long time, until 1905, when Einstein theorized that this phenomenon was caused by as-yet-unproven atomic particles actually smacking into the grains of pollen. He wrote up some fancy math, showing that his theory predicted this motion almost perfectly, and everyone had to concede that yes, tiny discrete bits of matter were indeed smacking into the pollen, and thus molecules, and by extension atoms, must exist. Today, we remember this botanist and his discovery by calling the motion he observed Brownian motion. It's kind of crazy that every physical thing you've ever interacted with is made up of little ball thingies. It started with people wondering what would happen if you just kept slicing something in half forever. Eventually, and of course it turns out that there's no knife sharp enough to do this, you end up with one pure unbreakable bit of that substance. The word atom, indeed, is from the Greek for indivisible, though, of course, as we learned in World War II, atoms can be broken as well. So, All right, so as we begin talking about bits and stuff, it'd be probably a good idea to learn Actually, it's more like review how we designate bits and stuff with. I can memorize names and symbols of selected elements. About how many naturally occurring elements are there? You think you know? Go. No. Closer. 88. There are 88 naturally occurring elements. There's 118, probably 114 that we know for sure, 118 that we think we have been discovered. So the rest are either, are, are man-made. So the total, and this is the firm total that we know for sure is 114, though we're pretty sure that we got 118 by now. What is the most abundant element on Earth? Earth. Carbon. Carbon. Wrong. Way wrong. Like, uh, extremely wrong. Yes. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. W wronger than his. Noah. Nitrogen. Nitrogen. About as wrong as his. Yes. So, unbelievably wrong. Maxine. Iron. Iron. No, really, really wrong. <laughs> the answer is... Yes. Adamantium. Um, close. Oxygen. What if I was to tell you the most common compound on the Earth's crust is silicon dioxide, SiO2. Okay, does it not make sense that if SiO2 is the most common compound, then since SiO2 has two O's, then oxygen is going to be the most common element. What's number two? Nitrogen. No, S silicon actually. Oh. Silicon, because silicon is the silicon dioxide. Hey, by the way, silicon dioxide is a big fancy word for what? Water. 
<laughs> water, no. Dirt, no. Silicon dioxide. silicon dioxide. What's silicon dioxide? Sand. Can you believe that sand is very plentiful on Earth? Sand, quartz, that's silicon dioxide. All right, what is the most abundant element? What is the most abundant element in your bodies? Yes. Go, Simon. Carbon? Carbon? And close, but not real close. Yes. No, way off, way off. Right. Oxygen. Yes. Oxygen. Number two is carbon, though it's a way off number two. Number three is hydrogen. Folks, we are hydrocarbons. We are hydrocarbons. We can also be thought of as ugly bags of mostly water, which is what the silicon life form in the Star Trek TNG episode, Silicon Avatar, called us. And you know what? It actually kind of fits. We are about 65% water. So, yeah, we're... Back, what? That's a really bizarre question. <laughs> All right, so oxygen, 50%, silicon, 26%. Wow, everything else less than that. <laughs> How about in your bodies? So Marie is 65% oxygen, carbon, 18, hydrogen, 10%, and then the rest is much smaller. So all these elements, how do... They describe all the different types of bits that there are and all the different types of stuffs. How do we symbolize these elements? With one or two letters. One or two letters. For those of you who love uppercase upper letters, we're going to have problems because the first one is always capitalized. The second one has to be lowercase. Why do some of the element symbols not match their names? Latin. Um, American English is like the standard scientific language these days. Well, what, what language was standard for science before American English? Latin. No. Latin. No. Latin. no. Latin. German. Latin. German. What was it before German? Latin. 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 So... These elements were discovered during the Latin stage of science. Iron. Theorem. So if you would like to discuss the iron content in the material, you would, you would, you would discuss its ferrous content. Plumbum. Ever wonder why plumbers are called plumbers? Because ancient plumbers used to work with lead. There used to be lead pipes. Actually, the Romans were one of the earliest civilizations to have running indoor water. Unfortunately, they used lead pipes. And the problem with lead is that tiny little bits of lead get into the water, and you drink little bits of lead, and it causes <laughs> all sorts of <laughs> mental problems. So... They get indoor plumbing, and then soon they are electing a donkey to be their next Caesar. Yes. Copper. Cupra. Silver. My ancestors, the Spaniards, they conquered portions of South America. There was one land in particular rich in silver. They called it? Chile. Argentina. Chile. Sodium is natrium. Calium is potassium. How about some orum? Would you like to have some orum? Orum is good. Girls want orum with a piece of with a piece of carbon on this on the top of it. Diamonds, that's right. Why do some elements have temporary names like unilquadium or unilpentium? Marie. No, no, they have been discovered. They haven't officially been named. Okay. Tupac Shakur's little brother. 
Ayupak has not named them yet. IUPAC is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, and they get together and argue over who the element should be named after. Everyone has their own pet scientists, so they literally argue over who it should be named after. They take votes, and then finally they decide who to name that element after. So IUPAC, Tupac's little brother, his nerdy little brother, All right, so you've already memorized it. Second target we need to reach today. I can compare and contrast various models of the atom as they have emerged historically from the Greeks to the modern electron cloud model. Identify the major characteristics of various models of the atom. Democritus, Thomson, Rutherford, Bohr, and the modern quantum mechanical model. So today and tomorrow, you will learn the entire history of the atomic theory. In other words, how we've come to understand what bits and stuff look like. How about some hang How do you picture an atom in your mind? Like this or like this or maybe one of these? If you understand enough about atoms to visualize any of those things, then you know more about atomic theory than the scientists did just a hundred years ago. And like way more than they thought they knew 2,500 years ago. That's when Greek philosopher Leucippus and his pupil Democritus first came up with the idea that matter is composed of tiny particles. No one knows how they developed this concept, but they didn't think the particles were particularly special. They just thought that if you cut something in half enough time, eventually you'll reach a particle that can't be cut anymore. They gave these particles the name atomos, which means uncuttable or indivisible. So basically they thought that iron was made up of iron particles and clay was made up of clay particles and cheese was made up of cheese particles. And they attributed properties of each substance to the forms of the atoms. So they thought that iron atoms were hard and stuck together with hooks. Clay atoms were softer and attached by ball and socket joints that made them flexible. And cheese atoms were squishy and delicious. Now this makes a certain amount of sense if you you don't happen to have access to electron microscopes or cathode ray tubes or the work of generations of previous scientists. Because the fact is, atomic theory as we know it today is the product of hundreds, if not thousands, of different insights. Some models, like that of Leucippus, were just blind guesses. As time went on, many more were the result of rigorous experimentation. But, as has been the case in all science, each scientist built on what had been learned before. There are just a few scientists. In, in, in human history that have been so brilliant that they just kind of made up most of what they discovered. Isaac Newton was one of them. Most other scientists were just normal people that studied what other people had come up with and added to it. And that's really the story of the atomic theory. It begins about 2,500 years ago. There was a battle, a battle between <coughs> Greek Greeks and Turkish Greeks. Remember, at this time, 2,500 years ago, about 500 years before the time of Christ, Greece, uh, Turkey, was settled in part by these Greeks known as Galatians. Okay? So, you had a group of philosophers in Greece, Greece, that believed that if you were to take a chair and cut it in half, you would have two pieces of chair. Cut one of those halves in half, chair. Cut it in half again, chair. Cut, chair. Cut, chair. Cut, chair. Cut, chair. Cut, chair. Cut, chair. How many times you cut it? It always had. It was always made up of chair. This was called the continuous theory of matter. It was proposed by two idiots that we don't like in chemistry by the name of Socrates and Aristotle. I don't care who was the student and I don't care. We don't like them. You see, the mainstream media absolutely love these guys. They loved everything about them. Anything they said became truth. So for almost 70, 20, 2200 years, 2200 years, Everyone believed in the continuous theory of matter. Okay? ABC, CBS, they all love these guys. We in chemistry don't like them. Because of them, chemistry is known as the dodo of all sciences. Really, 
Chemistry did not begin to evolve as a science, a science until the 1700s. What is the discontinuous theory of matter? At the same time, you had some Galatian philosophers. These were Turkish philosophers who were arguing. They believed this. This is so weird. Okay? They believed that you could only cut something in half so many times and then you got to the very indestructible portion of it. Everything was made up of different kinds of tiny little particles, which they called atomos, meaning indestructible, indivisible. So they believed everything, <laughs> so silly, they believed everything was made up of different types of atoms. <laughs> What dodos! Oh, they were right. No one believed them. Why? Because, you know, only really extreme bloggers believed in them and no one believed in them. Mainstream media said that they were dodos. Everyone believed that they were dodos. So, chemistry was the dodo of all sciences because no one respected these guys. Now, at the same, about 500 years later, came the writer of most of the New Testament. His name was Paul. And according to traditions, he studied the Greek philosophers. Which side did he believe in? Maybe, just maybe, Hebrews 11.3, if Paul wrote Hebrews. There's some question about that. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were made of things that which do not appear. In other words, Paul believed that all the stuff you could see was made up of stuff you couldn't see. So who did he believe in? The smart people. The smart people, Leucippus and Democritus. So for centuries, there was no way of scientifically proving one or the other, though most people believe Socrates because, after all, Socrates was so awesome and so great. But in the 1700s, get this, people like Lavoisier started measuring things using significant digits, using balanced scales. Oh my goodness! And as soon as they started measuring things, they started seeing patterns. Patterns that could only be explained by the theory of atoms. So three great laws were produced that helped us get chemistry back on the ball. Number one, you're already familiar with, the law of conservation of mass. Number two, the law of definite proportions. And number three, the law of multiple proportions. If I go too fast and you can't write it down, what should you do? Look on YouTube where you can pause. Or would it be nice to pause your teachers? You could hit pause and like hit play. Oh, yes, and we continue. Well, basically, you can pause your teacher on YouTube. Or you can just download the whole PowerPoint and just print out the notes page. What is the law of conservation of matter? Who remembers? Lavoisier's law of conservation of matter. Phobos. It's, um, it's the thing that says matter can't be destroyed or created. It can only it can change. change forms. All right. Let's see what Hank Green has to say. Lavoisier's work was, for a full century, the basis of all chemistry. Proving that you don't have to be rich to get a law at least temporarily named after you, French pharmacist Joseph Proust built on Lavoisier's ideas of extremely careful measurement, showing that a chemical compound always contains the same proportions of elements. For a while we called this Proust's law, but to make it easier to remember for the world, we just call it the law of definite proportions now. And then an English school teacher, John Dalton, followed Proust 
Proust by examining what at first appeared to be a problem with Proust's work. Carbon and oxygen, when reacted together, would form two different proportions, not just one. Of course, what was happening is obvious to us. Carbon and oxygen were reacting to form two different compounds, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. As Dalton's work continued, he found something truly mind-bendingly fascinating. If you limit the amount of carbon reacting to exactly one gram, the mass of oxygen consumed to produce one compound was 1.33 grams, while the mass consumed to produce the other compound was 2.66, exactly double. So when they started measuring, what did they notice? Look at that. 1.33 to 2.66. What a coincidence. It's twice as much. It's almost as if if you were to add an oxygen, you would be adding an exact amount of stuff. Woo! What was required for the other compound. This shook out for other reactions too. When reacting nitrogen and oxygen and limiting to exactly one gram of nitrogen, three compounds formed. One compound consumed 1.750 grams of oxygen, another consumed 0.875 grams. And what is the relationship between 1750 and 875? Exactly half. Oh boy! Coincidence? I think. And not. another consumed 0 0.437. What is the relationship between 875 and, 4, and 437? Folks, these atoms were coming together to form definite whole number ratios. There was only one. Four grams. All of those numbers are relatable by small whole number ratios. Oxygen wasn't reacting with some ephemeral cloud of the idea of nitrogen. It was reacting with individual discrete bits of nitrogen that couldn't be divided. It could react in a number of ways, but it was always the same oxygen and the same nitrogen with the same properties. And so while in our first episode we showed you how Einstein actually proved that atoms exist with super fancy math, Dalton had used multiplication to become the first person to actually have real, have real data, data supporting, supporting the idea, idea of atoms. Okay, so in review, law of definite proportion, the proportion by mass of the elements was always the same. What does that mean? It didn't matter where you got water, water was always made up of eight times more oxygen than hydrogen. See, he wasn't ready to talk about formulas but he was ready enough to say hey there is a pattern to all this there is a predictability it doesn't matter where I get the water from it's always eight times more oxygen than hydrogen Joseph Proust Dalton took it one step further he said okay Here's the splenation. Everything is made up of atoms. And because of that, the reason why you have eight times as much oxygen is because uh, hydrogen is teeny tiny and oxygen is eight times more and it requires twice as many hydrogens to bond with oxygen. So yeah, H2O baby, NaCl baby. He believed all matter came together to form compounds in the same whole number ratio, no matter where you were on Earth. Folks, we had rediscovered the atom. John Dalton in 1803 came up with the atomic theory. He described his atomic theory in four points. Two of these are yucky now. Two of them are still good. Thumbs up or thumbs down these things. Number one, all elements are made up of atoms and those atoms cannot be further subdivided and are therefore indestructible. Thumbs up or down? Down. Folks, we live in Oak Ridge. If it wasn't for the fact that this is wrong, you all would be the children of farmers. Okay? Because Oak Ridge was a farming community before it became a city. The whole purpose of this town originally was due to the fact that, yes, atoms could be split. 
atoms could be broken down into smaller bits. Oak Ridge proves that number one is wrong. How about this one? Thumbs up or, all, or down? All atoms of the same elements are exactly the same. Some thumbs up, some thumbs down. The answer is thumbs down. Once again, welcome to Oak Ridge. The whole reason for Oak Ridge existing was the need to separate uranium-238, which was worthless from, for us, from uranium-235, which is what went into the bomb. The difference between these two kinds of uranium are three little neutrons. That's just it, three little neutrons. So no, not all uraniums are created equal. Actually, not all atoms are created equal. Every element has a certain number of different flavors. What do we call the flavors? Yes, Max. Isotopes. How about this one? Thumbs up or down? Atoms of different elements are different. Thumbs up. Any thumbs down? Alec is being right on the fence. He's choosing both. Now he's absolutely right. Atoms of different elements are different. How about this one? When they come together to form compounds, they always come together in the same whole number ratio. Correct. Correct. Last 200 years, we proved that the first two points were, correct, were incorrect. But overall, we are back in business as a science. And even though this was in the late 1700s, early 1800s, within 100 years, we were already had found the different parts of the atom, and within 200 years, you know, we have iPods. Okay, you just cannot imagine how quickly chemistry has evolved. All right, maybe you can relate to uh, John Dalton. He came from a poor family. His formal schooling ended at 11. So what do you do when you're done with school? You become a teacher at the grand old age of 12. He also started making weather observations like, cool, it's cold outside today. Today it's snowy. Today it's sunny. 1799, he was 33 years old. He had a wife, he had kids. So he comes home and tells his wife that he has quit teaching, no longer teaching. I am going to dedicate my life to scientific inquiry. She goes, well, how much does that pay? Well, it doesn't pay anything, but people will be really happy with me in the future. Okay, fine, but we're not happy with you now. We're going to starve to death. All oh, things will all work out. Don't worry about it. Four years later, he had introduced his atomic theory. Seven years later, he had been inducted into the Royal Society of Science in England, joining people like Isaac Newton. He never really became rich. I mean, his family struggled. But now we know him as being el padre of the atomic theory. <laughs> so now we think he's really, really cool, even though his wife could have killed him when he quit his job. It was the atomic theory that led to the shocking discoveries of the 1800s. There he is. I think I kind of look like him. Thank you. Of course, Dalton's... Okay, so Dalton got us to a certain level. It's kind of like, you know, just like carrying the football over the 100 yards. It's just, it's usually not one person. It's one person giving it to another person, giving it to another person. So his work led us to understand how to write chemical formulas. So that was good. That's what we're going to learn how to do in two weeks. But near the late 1800s, we started experimenting with stuff that proved that atoms were they themselves made up of smaller bits of things. Along came a scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson. He based his work on the work of William Crookes. At this time, they were playing with these things called electroscopes. You would rub stuff and then bring that other stuff close to... Th these were two little gold leaves, just thin pieces of gold. 
And when you brought stuff that had stuff, the little gold leaves would separate. And they thought, oh, this is so cool. And then people started figuring out what was going on. Watch. Okay, I'm going to take this piece of PVC and rub it with this piece of silk so as to transfer electrons from the silk to the PVC. And now we'll see as I bring it towards the electroscope, along see the little leaf getting close to the plate on the top, you can see a bending of the gold leaf. And this is due to an induced charge on that gold leaf. And in fact, if I move the rod away, it goes back to indicate no charge on the leaf, bring it close, charge on the leaf. And we'll so basically they were saying, okay, so what's making the leaves go And they said, well, I think what we're doing is we're, we're rubbing negative particles off of this silk and the negative particles are going into the leaves and the leaves are wanting to separate because everyone knows that negatives don't like other negatives. Oh, okay, so where are the negative particles coming from? Uh, okay. Now, before we go on, let's review. The first atom, right at this point, they believed in the solid sphere model. Dalton's solid sphere model is what everyone believed in right now. All matter was made up of teeny tiny little spheres, little microscopic BBs. Okay? So, Crookes tube or the cathode ray tube constructed by William Crookes demonstrated that a beam of light was produced on one end and flowed toward the nut the positive end, and this led back to the battery. J.J. Thompson used this little gadget to prove that that solid sphere was wrong. There were things inside that solid sphere, negative things. Here's William Crookes. Here's his Crookes tube, which, by the way, x-ray machines are also based on his Crookes tube. Was why? Why do they behave the way they do? This led to the investigation of atomic structure. In the 1870s, scientists began probing what stuff was made of using discharge tubes, basically gas-filled tubes with electrodes at each end, which emit light when an electrical current passes through them. Basically, what a neon light is. Because this light was originally produced by a negative electrode or cathode, it was called a cathode ray, and it had a negative charge. But in 1886, German physicist Eugen Goldstein found that the tubes also emitted light from the positive electrode, basically a ray heading in the opposite direction, which meant that there must also be a positive charge in matter. Goldstein didn't fully understand what he'd discovered here. I mean, scientists still hadn't figured out what was responsible for the negative charge in the rays either. Then, English physicist J.J. Thomson took the discharge tube research further. By measuring how much heat the cathode rays generated, how much they could be bent by magnets and other things, he was able to estimate the mass of the rays. And the mass was was about a thousand times lighter than hydrogen, the smallest bit of matter known at the time. He concluded that the cathode rays weren't rays or waves at all, but were in fact very light, very small, negatively charged particles. He called them corpuscles. We call them electrons. So even though we didn't understand what shapes they took, we knew that there were both negative and positive components to matter. The next question was, how were they arranged in the atom? Thompson knew that the atom overall had a neutral charge. So he imagined that the negatively charged electrons must be distributed randomly in a positively charged matrix. And the very English Thompson visualized this model as a familiar English dessert, plum pudding, the positive matrix being the cake and the electrons the random floating bits of fruit within it. Even today, Thompson's model of the atom continues to be called the plum pudding model. And while a single electron's motion is random, the overall distribution of them is not. The next... All right, all right, okay. So, here's JJ right and this is what he played around with not this but here in a second before him they were had already created these things they plugged them into batteries created electricity wow they were called induction coils All right, so they thought, wow, this is kind of cool. It creates a light. So you're plugging the negative side of the battery 
to one end and the positive side to the other and the light always came from the negative end and went to the positive end. So they thought it was like negative light. They thought it was light until Thompson brought a magnet near it. Oh yeah, okay. It bent out of the way. He was not expecting this. This was really big because only matter can bend out of a path. That's called inertia. Okay? This light was acting like matter and not like energy. So he came to the conclusion that this light was actually a stream of negative particles, which he called electrons. So when you put the negative side down, it pushes it out. A gas. I'm not sure. Here is a piece of cross-shaped metal. Once again, by doing this, it proved that this stuff was made of particles. Okay, ever played around with, you know, it was like this metal frame. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And you could keep it spinning back and forth. A Chinese yo-yo or something like that. Okay, just to make it, make you happy. There, there, this is one of those yo-yos. It had paddles that had metal paddles. This once again proved that this light was particles. Because only particles could move things like this. Watch. All they're doing is flipping the positive and negative side. Look at that. You didn't think light could do that, huh? All right, so what did the cathode ray tube eventually evolve into? It evolved into our old style televisions, not the plasma TVs, the old style television, and it evolved into x-ray, x-ray machines. All right, so yesterday when we left off, we were talking about the fact that we had discovered the electron. There were tiny little particles that were negatively charged, but we really didn't know that much about them. It came to an American scientist by the name of Milliken, who was able to at least tell us how negative these little electrons were. Now, I'll have to tell you the truth. When it comes to the grand scheme of things in chemistry, what he came up with was really not that important to us. Later on in physics, it would be important to us, but for us here in chemistry, not very important to us. But the Millikan oil drop experiment was so cool. I had to show it to you. In 1909, Robert Millikan, working at the University of Chicago, succeeded in measuring the charge on the electron. He allowed a fine spray of oil to settle through a hole into a chamber where he could observe their fall. The top and bottom of the chamber consisted of electrically charged plates. Okay, I don't really understand this. Somehow by running electricity through these plates, it created areas of positivity and negativity. So basically there wasn't that many electrons here, a lot of electrons here, so this was positive and this was negative. And he could actually alter how positive and how negative they were by just moving a dial. That's it. That's all he had to do. As these little drops of oil fell down, they got hit by x-rays. These x-rays turned some of these drops of oil into negative drops of oil. Now keep in mind, they're now negative. So what are they going to do with this negative plate? Repel it, right? And what are they going to do toward this positive plate? So watch what happened. He introduced a source of x-rays which can cause creation of charges when they strike matter. Charges produced by the x-rays attached to an oil droplet, producing one or more charges on the droplet. When there is no voltage applied, the fall of the droplets is determined by their mass and the viscosity of air through which they fall. When a voltage is applied, 
the droplets that have a negative charge will fall more slowly, stop falling, or even rise, depending on the number of charges on them. By adjusting the applied voltage and observing the droplets both with voltage off and voltage on, Milligan was able to determine that the charges on the droplets were all multiples of a smallest value, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. He took this to be the charge on a single electron. Did you see what happened to those drops? They were suspended in air. That's kind of like anti-gravity. That was so cool. Now, if you're wondering, can we do that? Sure, if you get a really, really big electrical plate above you and below you and bombard you with x-rays, yeah, if you're alive, I, I don't think, no, this can't be done. This only can be done in, with teeny tiny little particles. So, basically what he discovered is that as he started suspending these guys in mid-air, it was always in intervals of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. So he came to the conclusion that that was the charge of an electron. Very elegantly done. Like I said, really is not that important to us. There is Robert Milliken. Okay, so let's review. Every time we get to a new, a new guy here, I always like to go back and review. What model was that? Solid sphere and who's responsible for the solid sphere model Dalton. Dalton okay that's the past now the new model he called it the plum pudding model because well it's kind of like fruitcake plum pudding is kind of like fruitcake with this cakey type thing and then there's pieces of plums interspersed. So he kind of thought that the atom was mostly this positive cake and the electrons were pieces of plum. For us here who live in East Tennessee, it would be more analogous to banana pudding, right? Or maybe chocolate chip cookies. Ooh, chocolate chip cookies. Where the chocolate chips are the electrons and the cookie part is the positive stuff. So, he had a student who, within a year, had completely changed the model yet again. This is his model. This is his student. His name was Ernest Rutherford. He was from New Zealand. Back then, there was a New Zealand. The hobbits had not quite gone into extinction, and neither had the orcs. New Zealand is where they filmed... Lord of the Rings. Here he is, uh, here's Ernest Rutherford and his student W.H. Geiger. W.H. was a German. He liked counting things. He uh, liked counting radioactivity. So he came up with the Geiger counter. Uh, also, you may also find him familiar because late at night when people were gone, you could go up to the lab and you could hear him go, one, one beaker, ah, 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 two, two beakers, ah, ah, three, three glass beakers, ah, ah, ah. Get it? The count? No, the count. Sesame Street. Didn't you watch Sesame Street? What? Didn't you like the count when he was saying, one girl, two girls, three girls? The vampire thingy. The vampire thingy, yes. No wonder. You guys didn't watch Sesame Street. That's why you're all so messed up. You watch Teletubbies, probably. His famous experiment is the Gold Foil experiment. And that completely changed everything. So you need to associate him with the gold foil experiment. Even he didn't design the gold foil experiment. He ripped it off from a girl. One of the greatest chemists of all time was a girl. Her name was Marie Curie. And she's like the mother of radioactivity. She helped discover alpha, beta, and gamma 
types of radiation. We'll talk more about her when we get to nuclear reaction. For now, let's let Hank Green Big step was taken by New Zealander Ernest Rutherford in 1909. He designed an experiment using an extremely thin sheet of gold foil and a screen coated with zinc sulfide. He bombarded the foil with alpha particles, which he didn't really know what they were, just that they were produced by the decay of radium, they were positively charged, and they were really, really small. He expected them to just fly right through the foil with no deflection, and many of them did just that. But as it turned out, some of the particles were deflected at large angles, and sometimes almost straight back. Backward. The only explanation for this was that the entire positive charge in an atom, the charge that would repel an alpha particle, must be concentrated in a very small area. An area that he called the nucleus. Because most of the alpha particles pass right through the atoms undeterred, Rutherford concluded that most of the atom is empty space. And he was correct. Rutherford would later discover that if he bombarded nitrogen with alpha particles, it created a bunch of hydrogen ions. Now, he correctly surmised that these tiny positively charged ions were themselves fundamental particles, protons. Now we're getting close to reality. So okay, so imagine this. Imagine you have a bowl of banana pudding. And you want to prove that there's really nothing to that banana pudding but yellow goo and wafers. So what do you do? You take a handgun and you shoot it. Okay? Because is there anything that could possibly deflect that bullet as it goes through the banana pudding? No! So you can imagine how amazed Ernest Rutherford was when that bullet deflected and came right back at him and he ducked. Thus proving that J.J. Thompson was wrong and an atom really did not look like banana pudding. Okay? In 1910, Rutherford and his co-workers were studying the angles at which alpha particles were scattered as they passed through a thin gold foil. Okay, so you basically have an alpha gun. There is a radioactive material there. And the radioactive material is giving off tiny little positive particles, bullets, okay? Thin, thin, thin sheet of gold foil, so thin that just a few atoms thick. So what was he expecting? He was expecting the bullets to go straight through. What he was not expecting was this, or this, or anything other than right here. That proved that the model was wrong. Oil. Most of the alpha particles pass through undeflected. However, a few were found to be scattered at large angles, some even back in the direction from which they had come. This meant that they had collided with an object much more massive than the alpha particles themselves, yet so small that only a few alpha particles encountered them. This atomic level view shows... So basically, Thompson was wrong. What if you were to take, Noah, what if you would take that whole bowl of banana pudding and super condense it down into a teeny tiny little, I mean, take all that mass and make it into something the size of a BB. Now, could it possibly deflect the bullet? Yeah. Okay. We had discovered what? The nucleus what is happening. Most of the atom is occupied by the low mass electrons. The nucleus is small and massive. When an alpha particle encounters a nucleus, it is scattered at a large angle. Okay. So, he came up with what we call the nuclear model. He was expecting this. This was the only explanation for what he got. All right, here we go. What do we call that? What and who? What and who? And now the new and improved model takes all of the banana pudding part, makes it into a super dense center, and then outside you have the vanilla wafers. 
This was called the nuclear model. And it was deduced using what experiment? Marielle knew there was a gold foil somewhere. And what was his name? Now, who can look at this model and tell me right off the bat, there is something wrong here. There's no like, outside line. What outside line? What is the charge on that nucleus? It's super positive. What is the charge on the electrons? Okay, what should be happening if this electron is just sitting there? What's to stop the electrons, as Noah is describing with his hands, from crashing into the nucleus? They should be crashing into the nucleus. Rutherford was close, but no cigar. By the way, Rutherford was a New Zealander. He went to study in Cambridge, England. He was really interested in radio waves, but he was persuaded to study radioactivity. Hey, it's got radio in it, doesn't it? Discovered and explained alpha and beta particles. Notice that the radioactive element called thorium gave off argon gas, thus proving that yes, you could convert one element into another. He was influenced by Marie Curie's work, and get this, he never got the Nobel Prize, but he guided 10 future Nobel Prize winners. That stinks, doesn't it? He should have gotten it from just his influence over 10 guys and gals. A few years later, experiments proved Rutherford was wrong. These chemists had a fairly good idea of the structure of the atom. They just needed to figure out what exactly the electrons were doing. Enter Niels Bohr. In 1911, the same year the results of Rutherford's gold foil experiment were published, Bohr traveled to England to study with Rutherford. And as a physicist, he was also interested in the mathematical model set forth by German physicists Max Planck and Albert Einstein to explain the behavior of electromagnetic energy. Over time, Bohr came to realize that these mathematical principles could be applied to Rutherford's atomic model. His analysis of the gold foil experiment, calculation based on the proportion of alpha particles that went straight through, those that were slightly deflected, and those that bounced almost completely backward, allowed him to predict the most likely positions of electrons within the atom. Bohr's resulting model, sometimes called the planetary model, is still familiar to most people, probably including you. It represents the electrons in orbits around a small central nucleus. Each orbit can have a specific number of electrons, which correlates to the energy levels and orbitals in the modern model of an atom. And while it's definitely flawed, Bohr's model is very close to reality in some important ways. Alright, so, things continue here. Bohr's model. There's Bohr, Danish scientist. Alright, here we go. Who? What? Bohr. Dalton? Dalton? Wait, what is it? Plum pudding. Not designed, gold foil experiment is what proved it. Here we go. Have you seen this? It is on the side of our school. It is what we think of the most. It is what you were taught as elementary school students, and it is what you were taught as middle school students, and it was and is wrong. Very wrong. We've known that it's been wrong for almost 100 years. All right. Now, let's go through this, and then I'll read it to you. You won't understand it, and then I'll give you an illustration that will help you understand it. 
According to the Bohr model, electrons travel in orbits around the nucleus. Each electron has a minimal amount of energy that will keep it in its lowest orbit and not allow it to crash into the nucleus. That is called ground state. When an electron gains energy, it will move to a higher orbit called a higher energy level. This higher orbit is called its excited state. This move will always be temporary. The electron will quickly lose energy and go back to its lowest orbit or ground state. All right, so here we go. Who is any oldest child here? Oldest? Marielle, how many siblings do you have? Two. Two? How many siblings do you have? One. We'll go with Marielle. Oh, Max, how many siblings do you have? One. Oh, gosh. You win. Okay, so Marielle, we get to make fun of you. Okay, so Marielle is in a family of three children. All her siblings are younger. Therefore, they're usually stuck closer to your parents, right? They actually spend more time with your parents than you do. You go home and you go into your room and you sulk because that's what teenagers do. So there is a minimum distance that you will get away from your parents. You may be stuck in their homes you may have to depend on them you may be eating their food but you don't have to be in the same room with them do you and you don't have to be like hugging them or anything showing affection yuck okay so what well, the minimum distance that she will get away from her parents we can call the ground state that is as close as she had and as long as she has some energy and some independence she's not going to get any closer to her parents now, she has a rich uncle who's the owner of El Cantarito. Oh, okay. So, but her uncle really, really loves her and likes to spoil her. Grant and Alec, I would really prefer if you're quiet. Thank you. Um, her uncle really loves her and likes to spoil her. So he comes up to her and says, Marielle, you're my favorite sobrina. Here, 100 dólares para ti. A hundred dollars just for you. Go spend it. Go spend it. Have fun. She thinks to herself, wait a second. I don't have to spend it. Maybe I can buy a low-yield CD at the nearest bank. And perhaps by the time I graduate, I can have almost ten dollars in interest collected. I can have a hundred and ten dollars. Then she thinks, eh, let's go to Turkey Creek. Yeah. Because a hundred dollars can only get you as far as maybe Turkey Creek. So she takes off for Turkey Creek and she gets dinner because she gets some friends to go with her. It's no fun going alone. Molly. Molly, Molly and Marielle in Turkey and Noah. Ma Molly, Marielle and Noah, Turkey Creek. After five guys, burgers and fries. After Menchie's. After um, Old Navy. Okay. There is nothing left. Uh-oh. How sad. She has no money. So what are her choices? She can live behind the dumpster in Old Navy or she can go back home. So she decides to go back home. Okay? So she goes back home, but she doesn't have to be in the same room as her parents do. So she goes back in her room and sulks like a good teenager until she can gain enough energy to go further away. What if her uncle had given her a thousand dollars? Molly? Noah and Atlanta, right? And what if it was like a hundred thousand dollars? She could be gone. She is gone. Okay. So this is Marielle. She lives in the first energy level according to Bohr. She doesn't crash into the nucleus because she always keeps back a little bit of energy because she doesn't want to be like touching her parents. Every once in a while, she will gain energy and go into what we call excited state. She will get as far away from the nucleus as she can possibly go with the money that she received. Okay? But will she hold on to that money indefinitely? No. As soon as she loses the money, she has to go back to ground state. So we believe that an atom is actually it's not these orbits are not static that means they're not constant like the planetary like like planets around the sun okay that these orbits can actually get further away 
and back to normal further away and back to normal so it's not as simple as we may think that is the Bohr model does the illustration help you I hope so okay the energy absorbed is called photons and what they have discovered is that an electron can receive a certain number of photons photons are like dollar bills if there were no coins photons would be the smallest unit of energy that could possibly make you go so if he gives you a hundred dollars it's like giving you a hundred photons and if he gives you a hundred photons you have to spend a hundred photons however many photons you get you have to spend so think of photons as a dollar bill the smallest subunit of money the higher the orbit the more energy Marielle contains the closer the electron is to the nucleus the less money she has the model led to the planetary model that you are familiar with okay all right so had we finally reached the end is this what the atom looked like 1930s and 40s experiments plus math proved this was wrong I'm so sorry but like everyone I've mentioned in the past couple of minutes, Bohr was at once fantastically right and way off. The problem was those pesky electrons. It was the German theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg who got everyone to understand just how huge and mind-blowing this electron problem was. But he was also the one who helped tie the whole mess up into a neat little bundle. Using his wicked math chops, Heisenberg discovered that it is impossible to know with certainty both the momentum of an electron, or any subatomic particle, and its exact position. And the more you know about one of those two variables, the harder it gets to measure the other one. So if you can't measure the position or momentum of an electron, you obviously can't say with certainty that the electrons in an atom are all neatly aligned in circular orbits. So he and a new wave of physicists and chemists proposed a new theory, a quantum theory, which proposes that electrons weren't particles or waves. Instead, they had properties of both and neither. By this thinking, the arrangement of electrons around a nucleus could only be described in terms of probability. In other words, there are certain regions where an electron is much more likely to be found. We call these regions orbitals. You know, the very same orbitals that you and I have been talking about. The ones that go by the names S and P and D and F and that form sigma and pi bonds. Those are the things that Heisenberg's theory predicts, and that's the modern understanding of atoms. Because it's based on probability, quantum style atoms are often drawn as clouds with the intensity of color representing not individual electrons, but the probability of finding an electron in any particular position. For this reason, the quantum model is often called the cloud model of the atom. And now you know! All the people I've mentioned and many others put their heads together over time to build this current and I might say quite elegant understanding of atomic theory. Now after 2500 years even though we can't see them we can know what they're like and how they work because a long succession of scientists contributed bits and pieces to the whole fantastic picture. But it's also important to recognize that we still may not be quite all the way right. Thompson's contemporaries were sure that the plum pudding model was right. Scientists in Bohr's day fully believed that the planetary model was right and today, we're extremely confident that the quantum model is correct. But it may not be all the way correct, and that's where you come in. The only way we can go on being sure is to keep asking questions and conducting experiments. And that's why you're taking chemistry and physics. Pay attention! And, yeah, it's been proven to be incorrect already. So, you've got a nucleus with electrons around it, the electrons are more likely to be closer to it than they are apart and the further away you get the less electrons you have so what does this all mean I don't know I don't understand the charge cloud model it's a math model I never quite got the whole math thing so basically each one of these dots represents where electrons probably are but then then again maybe they're not but probably but not certainty we're not sure but more than likely, no, we don't know. Okay, so let's go through the models again. You ready? Oh, yeah. Wow, you all speak as one person. That's amazing. <laughs> Pete Thompson? No, 
Rutherford. <laughs> All right, how about this one? Nucleus with And who is the scientist? Uh, no, really. This was this was a collective thing. This was a collective thing. Now the new model has they've taken the protons away from the nucleus so now the there's two areas of protons and the neutrons have been removed from the nucleus due to all these experiments they've been doing at CERN in France and then the electrons are said to be rotating back and forth and they call this the Merino smiley face model I made it up. <laughs> this is my model. I did this one. You like it? Neutrons. Nose for neutrons. Get it? So who's to say that I'm wrong and they're right? I have a better drawing than that. Is that good enough? <laughs> 